morning and welcome everyone to Better Information. Um, I'm Claire Kennedy and welcome to um, today's session. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. We recognise their abiding connection to this land, its waterways and community. The Office of Victoria Law Foundation is on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And it's our privilege to pay respects to their elders and all generations of Wurundjeri people who've nurtured this land for over 50,000 years and continue to do so today. Thanks everyone for coming along today. Today our topic is using case studies effectively. And we're looking at this through the lens of the project, the right of people to make their own medical decisions funded by um, Victoria Law Foundation. The project was undertaken by the Office of the Public Advocate um, in partnership with the Intellectual Disability Self-Advocacy Group, Reinforce. The project involved the development of case studies for a brochure at, which was actually aimed at health professionals. And the case studies were developed in a way that was very sensitive to those telling their story and the journey was as important as the outcome. So today's session will, will uh, be made up of a joint presentation followed by a Q&A led by our Executive Director, Lynn Hortang. Um, and now just for a few housekeeping tips, only panellists can be seen and heard in this webinar. All attendees' videos are turned off and your audio is muted. The session is being recorded for distribution afterwards. And we're also trialling captions for the first time. So you'll see a closed captions button at the bottom of the screen and you should select show subtitles if you'd like to see them. Um, now feel free to chat, uh, to click on the chat now and say hello and where you work if you like. Um, it's great to see everyone here today. We've had over 100 registrations, so there's clearly a lot of engagement um, on this subject. Today we're doing the questions a little bit differently. Four questions um, from the audience. We're going to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to pop some questions in during the webinar and then we'll come to them later on in the session. So now we'll begin with our co-presentation and we'll begin with Dr. Natalie Thomas. Natalie is a Senior Policy and Research Officer at the Office of the Public Advocate. She works in the Systemic Advocacy Unit and leads the development of OPA's Disability Action Plan. And she'll be joined by Emma Usher. Emma is the Legal Education Project Officer Officer at the Office of the Public Advocate, and she's involved with the development of legal publications and projects. Um, sorry, legal education publications and projects. And currently this includes OPA's Healthy Discussions Project, which is about supported decision making. And we'll also hear from Colin Hisco. Colin is a long-term advocate for the rights of people with intellectual disability. He's president of Reinforce, which is the longest running self-advocacy group run by and for people with intellectual disability. Um, Colin is a member of the Victorian Disability Advisory Council, which advises government on ways to build a more inclusive Victoria. And now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Natalie Thomas for her to start off the presentation. Thanks, Natalie. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks, Claire. Thank you for inviting us to speak today. Um, we're going to be talking about a project that we have done at the Office of the Public Advocate together with Reinforce. Um, and I'm now going to um, hand over to, in, I'm going to now acknowledge country and I'm sitting on the Boorurung land of the, of the people of the Kulin Nation and I want to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and I want to acknowledge also that the sovereignty of this land was never ceded. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Emma. Thanks Natalie. Um, the Office of the Public Advocate, or OPA for short, was very pleased to work with Reinforce on the project that we are taking a look at today, the right of people to make their own medical decisions. It was about everyone's right to play an active role in making decisions about their own health and to receive the support they need to do so. Uh, as part of this project that was funded through a Victoria Law Foundation small grant, OPA and Reinforce produced two brochures, uh, one targeted at health professionals, uh, the one you can see there, and an Easy Read brochure. So Easy Read uses images, plain English, short sentences, and a larger font size. It focuses on key information. Um, this Easy Read brochure has information about medical decision-making aimed at people who visit doctors or hospitals. 
So the project aimed to help health professionals think about how they can actively support people with a disability, if they need support, to be at the heart of decisions about their own health, rather than swept along by health systems. Um, the brochures were also about raising awareness of recent changes to the law in Victoria, which have promoted the importance of supported decision making. Uh, and for example, this could involve as uh, someone having extra time to make a decision or someone who helps uh, a person by discussing the decision or it might be information explained in a different way, uh, which could in include using pictures. Um, as part of the project, Reinforce interviewed three people with disability about their experiences. They are the lived experiences of people with intellectual disability and acquired brain injury, both good and bad experiences. The de-identified individual stories in the brochure for health professionals are a powerful reminder of how important important it is for everyone to have information about their health in a way that they can understand and to be at the centre of decisions about their own health. So at the workshop today, we're focusing on these stories or case studies and how Reinforce and OPA got the case studies together that are in the brochure. And so we hope that this uh, example may give you some ideas for your own projects um, and we will share some resources that we found helpful uh, when doing the project. So before talking about the project, we first wanted to say something about Reinforce and OPA. So I'll just hand over to Natalie to say something about OPA. Thanks, Natalie. Okay. Well, the Office of the Public Advocate, for those who don't know, is an independent statutory body um, of the Victorian Government. Our statutory status comes from the Guardianship and Administration Act. We have a new Act, 2019, which um, first incorporates the principles of supported decision making. Um, our main goal is to safeguard the rights and interests of people with a disability in Victoria. Besides guardianship, we run a number of volunteer programs, for example, community visitors, which visit um, mental health services, supportive residential services and disability services to make sure that people's rights are held up and that, um, and that issues are dealt with. Um, we also have a systemic advocacy unit because we use the data we get from the guardianship programs and um, other programs that we run to advocate to government and other, other organisations for change to promote the rights of people with a disability. And I think I'll hand over to Colin now. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome and thank you for coming to today's session. I just want to talk briefly about Reinforce. So Reinforce started in 1981 and we run for and by people with an intellectual disability. We promote the rights of all people with an intellectual disability to, to be upheld in the same way as anybody else in the community. And uh, we've, we've been at the forefront of the movement to close institutions. Uh, why are we just saying about promote the rights of all people with intellectual disability to have the same basic human rights as anybody else? Um, if you, you are allowed to get married, you're allowed to have a family, you're allowed to go to the hotel. You've got all heaps of rights. But with people with a disability, we haven't got those. We may have little bits and pieces, but uh, most of them we can't have because we've got a disability. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Um, and I just want to sh share now a video which uh, leads on from uh, what Colin was talking about, which is um, about self-advocacy generally. Um, and it features members of Brain Injury Matters, which is a self-advocacy organisation run for and by people with acquired brain injury. Um, this video is found on the website called Voices Together. Self-advocacy is essential, especially in this in this um, in these environments that we live in now. Self-advocacy is really simple. It's about having a voice. Self-advocacy is designed to 
get the individual to stand up for themselves. Able to speak for yourself and I've realised how important that is. Because if, not, if we don't speak for ourselves, ain't nobody going to speak for us. It gives you an opportunity to own disability and brain injury with pride. Self-advocacy to me means uh, helping people, people that don't have a say. And, uh, and I've come across many people who can't do that. So if I can help those people do that for themselves, that'd be good. Having a disability, uh, being able to communicate to other people with disabilities, um, how positive you are and, uh, and uh, representing people with disabilities and being that representative, uh, being able to live life, have a happy life. It's just really important. It's just really important that people have a voice, that everyone has a voice and um, so many people in society do have a voice, but people with disabilities don't, and so many don't. Some few, of course, do, um, and they are great at speaking up for others. But most of the time, we many people try to pass or not, you know, hide their disability, and it's, for many people with brain injury, it's possible to hide that. And I think self-efficacy gives you an opportunity to to explore being out and proud. And um, personally, I see that as a really powerful way to create change. Self-advocacy comes down to the fact that it's the individual telling you about themselves. If you can do that and people want to hear it from you because having other people speak for you gets you nowhere and you are the best person to know what your needs are and to speak for yourself. I hope it remains as strong as it is in Victoria and Places like BIM can have a say in how our state is run. And following that, I wondered, Colin, if you wanted to say anything about what self-advocacy means uh, for you. Uh, yes, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, self-advocacy... Uh, for me is really, really important. And it's taught me a very lot, uh, a lot about life and things in general, and to be able to, to advocate for, for, for my rights. Sometimes I may need a little bit of support here and there to do things, but it's really, really important that all people with a disability uh, learn uh, and, and understand that they have uh, the rights the same as anybody else. Thanks, Colin. Um, so now I'll just hand over to Natalie um, to talk about how the project started. Thanks, Natalie. Um, sometimes, thanks, Emma. Sometimes you think I'm just going to another meeting. It'll be another AGM. It's AGM season. I'm going to Ross House again for another AGM. This will be interesting, but nothing will, you know, this is just a normal AGM meeting. Well, Emma and I and one of the legal officers at OPA went to this AGM because um, the legal officer was came with us because she was speaking about sort of the new Medical Treatment Act and she wanted to inform people about their rights under that act. And in, in the process of her um, speech and telling people what what power, what what um, the act did the medical treat new medical treatment act did we started hearing a whole lot of stories about the terrible interactions people were having with their doctors and how doctors wouldn't listen to them and weren't weren't doing anything they wanted to do and didn't care about telling them how to do things in a way they understood and when we were walking back to opa we thought well this is not terrific and um we had a meeting at opa and said we wanted to do something about this, but we needed to work with the organisations to do it and that we would do all the backroom work and try and see if we could get some project funding together so that the organisations could get paid to do the work and then we would work with them together. So we went to Reinforce and said, are you interested in working with us? And they went, yes. And then from that, um, Emma wrote a small grant application to the Victorian Law Foundation and the project started. Last year in 2019. Thank you, Natalie. Um, 
And at this point, I, I wanted to mention that there was another path that OPA could have taken and to also mention a useful resource that I found uh, very helpful at this early stage. Um, so OPA had heard people's stories at the Reinforce AGM. So we had an idea of some people's experiences. So one option might have been to organise a focus group, uh, ask people to share their stories at the focus group and recognise people's time with uh, gift vouchers. OPA could have then gone on to produce a um, resource. But OPA didn't choose to do this. And I think um, this is a very simplified version of a chart from a resource that helps to explain why. So... Um, it's from a resource developed by Women with Disabilities Victoria and it's about guidelines for developing resources with women with disabilities about safety from violence and abuse. While our project wasn't about this, I found one of the guidelines in particular in this resource very helpful. And this is a guideline about the people that a resource seeks to support being involved in the resource design, delivery and development. Um, it says that this approach improves the quality, relevance and accessibility of resources and promotes empowerment. It also says that it's important to recognise people's involvement in some way financially and the best option here is for people to be paid and involved from the start of the project to the finish, which is the co-design model, and um, also that resources should include stories of lived experience. Um, I found the, the chart that's in the resource really helpful and this is a very simplified version of this that chart um, because the chart recognises that for reasons of time and resources, it may not always be possible to use a co-design co approach like that. But that it's good to keep in mind that that is what we aim for. And I should mention at this point that for our project, the small grant from the VLA, uh, Victoria Law Foundation, was used to um, pay Colin and his support worker at Reinforce for their time working on the project, uh, for gift vouchers for the people that Reinforce interviewed, uh, for graphic design costs, and uh, for a license to use the artwork on the front of the brochure, which is by a person with intellectual disability. Um, now to take a bit of a closer look at the process we used in the project. Uh, Natalie has some questions for Colin uh, to hear his thoughts. Thanks, Natalie and Colin. Okay. Um, okay, Colin, why was it important for, for a self-advocacy organisation to be running the project? Wow, you ask hard, difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> you tested my memory. Um, no, all jokes aside. Um, I think it's really important that self-advocacy groups uh, are running the project uh, because people with a disability that's got the expertise and the skills to do certain things, uh, they're willing to tell their stories. Uh, and I think it's really great that they be given every opportunity that they can get uh, to be able to do that. Uh, and in partnership with OPA was one of the great ways we could do it. Thank you. Okay, what, Colin, what were the different skills that Reinforce and OPA had for this project? Um, different skills. <clears throat> uh, I think because of um, Emma and her support, and yours, uh, your support as well, Natalie, um, Writing the submission and uh, coming along, coming along to our AGM, uh, having a guest speaker. They're talking about rights of people. Then people with a disability, uh, maybe in some cases for the first time, uh, being able to open their mouth and to talk about what they want and what they need and what they're feeling. Um, um, why is it important for me uh, to be able to have my voice? Uh, and also in regards to the skills part, uh, I guarantee, or well, I think that nobody uh, within the reinforced office would have the uh, the capacity or maybe the knowledge to, to be able to do that. Uh, so 
uh, this is where the, uh, Emma came and, and uh, moved in and said that she'd be willing to do that. So thank you. Okay. So why did Reinforce do the interviews? Um, like it was I just saying before, I think it's really, really important that people uh, with a, an intellectual disability or any disability get the opportunity and the chance uh, to be able to uh, explain their situation, explain uh, what is wrong with the system or what has been wrong with the system. Um, and for me, uh, that was really important uh, for Reinforce uh, to be a part of that process and uh, get people to interview and tell their story. And how did Reinforce choose the people to interview, Colin? Oh. Um, I think because of the shortness of the project, and I think that Emma and I had uh, a bit of discussion around this, uh, what we decided to do was that uh, El, um, Ellie, who was my support at the time in helping me to, to run this prog program with, with uh, Emma and Natalie in the background, um, we decided that we'd go and ask a couple of people that we knew uh, and we'd try and uh, we'd try and explain. So, for an example, if I'm asking Natalie now, who has a disability, and I'm asking her if she'd like to come to the project uh, to to give her story. So, I'll be telling that I'll be explaining to Natalie what it is we're going to do, what's the process, what's your involvement, and making sure that uh, Natalie. Is okay, is okay with all of that information. Then once we come to the actual interview, again with Natalie, we'll be going through the whole process again, like we've already been through. Uh, and we'd be good, we were telling them that uh, we were also wanting to record the interviews. But the most important part of the whole interviews was that their name doesn't get mentioned. Uh, and I think that was very, very important. And they agreed with it going on the Reinforce website, I think the upper website as well. Um, and what happened next was that if people were not happy with something, so Nat uh, Emma's wrote up all the report. Now Natalie is the first person, so that'll go back to Natalie. Natalie reads it. Yes, I like it. No, I don't. This is what I don't like. Then it'd go back to Ellie. Ellie would retype the words that Natalie wanted. Then it'd go back and forth, back and forth, like that all the time, till everybody was happy. And eventually, uh, everybody was happy. And thanks to Wilpa, uh, we had a fantastic launch. Okay, how did Reinforce decide on the questions to ask, Colin? <sighs> um. For me, what I vaguely remember now is uh, there was uh, Natalie, uh, myself, uh, Ellie, a few other people, maybe from Reinforce, maybe yourself as well, Natalie. And what we did, we looked at what is it that we want to get out of this project? And what we want to get out is that people with a disability, intellectual disability or whichever, um, they know that they have the same rights as anybody else. Um, so that once we knew that, then we looked at, okay, what kind of questions do we think we can ask in relation to that topic? Uh, and then we came up with quite a, uh, quite a load of, of uh, questions. And I believe if my memory serves me right, we had to, uh, to call some of them because there was too many. But that's how we did it. Um, did Reinforce ask everyone the same questions, Colin? Um, yes, we did. For me, that was very, very important uh, that we asked the same questions. And I think you need to do that in any other project that you're doing if you're interviewing people. That it needs to be the same so you can get, hopefully get some kind of a balance of what people are saying and thinking and feeling. Um, and uh, yes, everybody was happy uh, with the final story. 
how did reinforce check that the people interviewed were happy with the final story? You've, I think well, just like happy. I said before that uh, we kept going back and forth, back and forth, uh, making sure that people were happy with what had been written about what they said. Now, uh, just one other thing. When I said not mentioning people's names, what we did, we asked the person that was being interviewed and we explained that we don't want to use their name uh, for privacy reasons. Um, what is the name that you would like to be called? And they came up with their own name. So, yeah. And everybody was really happy with the process that we did. Thanks, Natalie and Colin. Um, we wanted to share some of the challenges that we had with the project. Um, and so one of the things was thinking about whether to record the interviews, whether to um, store the interviews. Um, and in the end, Reinforce recorded the interviews only for the support worker to be able to type them out later and she then deleted them. Uh, in terms of storing the interviews, and the end reinforced decided to only store the typed out interviews de-identified. Um, and reinforced only provided the typed out de-identified records of the interviews to OPA. OPA's communications officer helped to cut back the interviews to fit the space available in the brochure while keeping the most compelling parts of the story. And before this reinforced had already cut the stories back by focusing on the key parts. So um, around permissions, and I think Colin's really talked about this, um, Reinforce did have something for people who were interviewed to sign, um, but Reinforce also spent quite a bit of time at the start of the interview uh, talking about this. Uh, now, how do you support people if the interview brings up bad memories? I think this is an area that we could have done better um, with. It's not always easy to know how to do this. Uh, for example, it may not be easy to have a counselling service available. Uh, it may only be possible to link people with existing support services. However, I think on reflection um, that it's an area that we probably should have given more thought to and an area of the project that I think we could have done better in. Um, it's not always easy to know if something has brought up a bad memory for someone and people may not always indicate uh, to you. Uh, another area of the project that was challenging was the time involved in thinking about all the steps in the project and all of the, um, the concerns or problems that we thought might come up. So each of the steps was really important to think about and to talk about, but it meant having meetings and it took longer than we expected. So now I'd like to hand over to Colin to say something about some of the key things we learned from the project. Thanks, Colin. Thank you. Um, interviews and short stories. I believe they are really, really powerful and uh, really important. I also believe that it's also important, which we're going to do in our next project coming up, uh, is, to, is to videotape everything. Uh, because one of the things that I found, uh, we put a submission in once to some way, and uh, we also put in a submission, a video submission, a video talking, people talking with a disability about why they should give us the money. Um, and we were told afterwards that that video, uh, even though they liked the, the process of what we were doing and what we were going to be saying, it was a video that swayed them into giving us the money and, to, and uh, making whatever it was we were going to be doing. So also that is very, very powerful. Um, just quickly, one of the stories that we were, one of the ladies that we were interviewing, um, we asked the question and her response was that I'd like to do this in two ways. I'd like to tell you my answer in two ways. First, first way, before I got my disability. The second way, now I've got my disability. Both Ellie and I looked at each other and thinking, wow, you know, 
We never thought of that. And we never thought about asking anybody to, to, to tell their story before they got the disability, if you could remember, or after they got the disability. Uh, in, regards to, in regards to good and start small, that's one of the reasons why we've done it. Um, and uh, we, we wanted to do a pilot project, so that's another reason uh, why we went small. Uh, like Natalie was saying, uh, not Natalie, um, Emma was saying about taking time for the interview and things went longer. Uh, and that was just to allow people with a disability, the space and the time to be able to respond to what they're wanting to talk, talk to us about. Um, and it was also one of the things that I think that you need to do. We, we never did this because uh, we knew all the three people that we were going to be interviewing. But for me, uh, I believe that it's really, really important that you build up the trust and relationship uh, between the people that uh, you're talking to and are going to be telling you uh, about what it is that you're asking them. Uh, they're not going to know you from a bar of soap, maybe, and maybe uh, you don't know them from a bar of soap. So that's one of the reasons why I think you need to build up that trust and relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, and following on from that, I think through the project, uh, OPRA and Reinforce also built our uh, relationship and the trust. Um, and uh, it was really a big part of leading to a bigger project. Um, so while we started small, um, it led to this bigger project, which is funded by the National Disability Insurance Agency. Uh, and it's a project to help health professionals communicate better with people with dis disability who have special communication needs. So uh, this project, we're able to use many of the ideas that came up during the earlier project, um, but because that was a small project, we weren't able to do all, all those ideas. Um, so that included have it, um, that we'll be doing um, short videos, um, holding information sessions um, where people with lived experience of disability will be involved in presenting. Um, and there will be employment of people with disability through uh, the project. And just at this point, I, I wanted to ask Colin if you could say something about why you think um, employment of people with disability is really important um, for uh, projects like this. Yeah, thank you. Um, I believe it's re really, really important that whenever possible, uh, that the, you, you're using uh, people with a disability. Some people may have the skills already, uh, but I also believe it's important for them to be able to uh, gain the skills uh, and, and knowing what, what to do. And having that first pay packet, my first pay packet that I had, I'm thinking, wow, this much, there's got to be a mistake. And when I knew there was no mistake, then I had fun spending it, except for rent. <laughs> Thanks, Colin. Um, so, and finally, the uh, the bigger project also is around showcasing the skills and ability of the project workers. And uh, part of the project is also really about uh, changing attitudes. And there was some research done in New South Wales saying um, that the general community can uh, underestimate the skills and abilities of people with intellectual disability. Um, so we think it's really important to be showcasing those skills and abilities. Um, so uh, this is just a look at what the brochure that we produce looks like. It is a very short brochure. It's four-sided um, uh, A4 uh, brochure. And you can see that the heart of the brochure is the stories. Um, and definitely that's the, the main part of the brochure. So there were a number of useful resources um, that, that were helpful in relation to the project. So one I mentioned earlier um, is our right to safety and respect guidelines for developing 
resources uh, with women with disabilities about safety from violence and abuse. And um, there's also two Victoria Law Foundation reports that I think are, are really useful. Um, one is called When I Tell My Story, I'm in Charge, Ethical and Effective Storytelling in Advocacy by Rachel Ball. Uh, and another is I Feel Empowered, I Know My Rights, Communities Empowered by Peer Educators and Paralegals by Jacinta Maloney. So the first focus is on the power of storytelling and possible approaches and challenges. And the second uh, looks at examples of peer community education and peer paralegal programs. So the peer programs described in, in, in this resource are far more ambitious than our project. But among many other things, um, there's a really useful discussion about paying people in peer roles and it's very interesting and I think echoes some of, of what is in the Women with Disabilities uh, Victoria resource. Um, also, the Voices Together website, um, so the video that we showed earlier about self-advocacy is from the uh, Voices Together website and uh, it's an online resource for self-advocacy groups, the government and the community to share and connect, uh, share information and connect. Um, so there's some great videos and other resources on that website. Also, uh, uh, Voices at the Table um, is a project of the Self-Advocacy Resource Unit that aims to increase the number of people with cognitive disabilities sitting on boards, committees and advisory groups. Um, and uh, yeah, really, really great uh, project. Um, and finally, I should also mention uh, photo symbols. Um, uh, the photo images in this presentation are from uh, photo symbols and uh, this website has images for producing easy read. Um, it's a UK website and there is a cost to subscribe, but I should, thought I should mention it since we have used those images. Um, and I will now like to hand over to Natalie. Um, thank you, Emma. Um, I just wanted to close because and just to thank the Victorian Law Foundation for funding the project and for Reinforce's enthusiastic support, as well as the Office of the Public Advocate's support. I should say, the um, when you saw the brochure, there was a picture of Colin, and on the other side was the Public Advocate, who was really enthusiastic about us doing this project. So I want to thank the Office of the Public Advocate and the Victorian Law Foundation, and my co-producers who've co-presenters have done an excellent job. Thank you very much. Thanks, Natalie, and thank you also um, to, to all of you. That was really very, very interesting. Um, very, very interesting. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to introduce Lynn Holtain, the Executive Director of VLF, and who's going to facilitate a discussion and then the Q&A. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. And Emma, Natalie and, and Colin, thank you so much for, for that uh, great insight into the process of making a really important document that we are enormously proud to be associated with. And I, I should just explain that that lovely picture at the launch, which was a really joyous affair of me and Colleen Pierce and Colin, I think you can tell the effect of isolation on my hair. <laughs> I looked at that picture and I thought that wasn't so long ago and now I look like this. Anyway, back to, uh, to the case at hand. I think um, some really important lessons were learned through this process and Emma and, and Natalie and Colin, I look forward to, to teasing those out. But it struck me really powerfully at the beginning of your presentation with the, the video around self-advocacy the case studies are in themselves a sort of form of, of self-advocacy. They're an opportunity to really hear directly from the people that, that you are trying to, to represent in, in, a, in a document or a, some kind of uh, presentation that supports other people's thinking about, um, about how to undertake you know, various um, tasks, including you know, communicating properly with people with intellectual disabilities. And that other very powerful line that, you know, we hear so often, but it never fails to, to make an impact on me, nothing about us without us. And how critical that is to the thinking around powerful communication, that it, unless you are engaging with the people that you are attempting to represent, 
and to giving them an opportunity to, to put their point of view as directly as possible, then you, you are making a very, uh, I think, grave mistake in terms of the way in which you're trying to, to um, get the, those messages across. But I'm really interested when we've got some great questions, which we'll come to in a moment, some of which um, I had in my mind as well. But there's this interesting tension in some of the things that, um, that you've all said about privacy. So, Colin, you were very careful that people's names weren't attached and that they chose their own names for the case studies and that uh, the transcripts were, were uh, Emma explained that the transcripts only were passed on to OPA and that, that um, you didn't have any vo voice passed through to, to the organisation. But on the other hand, you're saying we're going to make some videos. So in that instance, obviously, with videos, you're going to have real people and their real stories. So is privacy a really important dimension to this or is it something that's that's useful sometimes and not always. Um, if you're asking me, I think it's all, always important. And <clears throat> I think we, we all need to, uh, to be able to talk, discuss and debate the issue. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, I was asking if we can either keep the recorded message or the, or the, the, the other thing that we did end up keeping was that I believe that later on, sometime in life, if we're getting people coming through, then we can show them the stuff and some of the information that we've been doing and some of the stories of people uh, with a disability because there was no names or anything. Uh, I, I am not sure how to, how to answer in regards to the video side of things. Um, I still think you might be able to use your own na uh, uh, an alias name, but the problem might be is that uh, if, if I'm being a person being interviewed, and Lynn, you know me, uh, you've seen me, you know that that's not my name, you might be wondering what in the hell I'm, you know, why am I using a different name? So mm. I think there's a lot more talking, discussing, uh, debating around that whole thing. Uh, but I'm going to be in there pushing for that we try and keep as much privacy as we can. And I believe uh, that's really important, uh, and in particular in, the, in people's stories. And um, I just wonder if I could add with the um, videos, we haven't started that. And as I think Colin's saying, we, it's a very vague idea at the moment. And because of a sort of co-design approach, we know that we'll have to spend time talking about what, shape that should take and yeah talking back and forward but and that's what we certainly found in this project that it took time each step took time because there was a lot to think about um in how you uh, uh, approach anything um so i suppose what that that boils down to for me is that that um that that right to to tell your story but to remain private is really critical and that that you're your wish to remain private shouldn't stop your story being told. Yes. And that, that I suppose is a discussion that you have with the participants about whether or not they're happy to use their real names or not, whether or not they're happy to be on video in the public domain, or if it's something that maybe just the advocacy organisation like Reinforce keeps as their own property and resource for, for further down the track. So there's a debate and discussion to be had around that. Mm. Because I know in other circumstances where case studies have been used, people have regretted having their real names and their real images attached to the story because years later they may have moved on and things have changed for them and they are still attached um, to this story in the public domain. So I think that's, that's an issue that I'm aware of when people uh, use case studies that you have to be really mindful of. So I thought it was... It was a good thing to, to tease out a bit further. Am I able to... Yes, please, Natalie, on you go. In here? Um, with the, I mean, to me, what everybody's been saying is talking about the tension between creating change by providing evidence, because mm -hmm. um, I'm also a historian by training, so this is what I do with a lot. Um, when you provide evidence, it can be in a whole range of ways, and 
when you're providing an actual person's story, you're right, it stays around forever. So one of the things you have to do is you have to say to somebody, look, if you make a video with your image or your real name, or even if it's not your real name, but, but your photo and or your film, um, your video, then in 10 years time, somebody may recognize that it's you. And so people could decide that they don't want to do that. Um, so I just think you have to be upfront with people and walk them through all the different things that could happen and provide some support for them um, when the process is happening to make yeah. sure that they understand. And that can take time. Yeah. In the end, absolutely. That, you know, in the end, they might go, well, yes, but I don't want you to show my picture, but you can use a false name. And, and That's that right. Can be yeah. So it's giving people options in terms of the way in which they, they tell their story. I think that's a really critical dimension to this. Do you think organisations are getting better at this, at engaging with people, at uh, uh, hearing and telling their, their stories in a sensible way? Are we getting better at this? Um, I think so, but I, I also still think there are places that I'm not going to mention uh, that are not doing not doing it at all, um, and I do I think that um, in one way that's wrong. You know, people with a disability uh, should be allowed and able to tell their stories. That's what they want to do. Fair enough. I, I suppose it was a bit of a rosy view from me that maybe you know things are getting better. Natalie, what's your view? Um, I was just contemplating this particular question yesterday in relation to a, a document that I was writing and it occurred to me to say, well, yes, we need to pro promote more positive attitudes about people with a disability in the community. And sadly, we have an aged care role commission. We have a disability, violence, neglect and abuse. Expo There's another order to that, but, you know, the violence, ne abuse, neglect and exploitation. If things were really good, we wouldn't need those. So we've still got a lot. And I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to say mm -hmm. that all, a lot of organisations are doing the good things, but there's an awful lot of people that just either have very different attitudes to people with disability, are terrified of them, or just don't think about what, what it means until they have some connection. So I still think we have a lot. I'm not trying to say that you know, it's all despair and gloom. We have made lots of improvements, but I think we've got a long way to go mm. still. Emma, do you have any final comments there? Um, I don't really have much more to add other than to say um, I certainly found some great examples um, when um, in the early stages of the project. So it, it's fabulous to be able to see what other organisations are doing and to get ideas from what other people are doing. And you have certainly added, I think, to, to that um, body of, of knowledge and understanding about how to under, um, undertake a project like this. And thank you all very much indeed for joining us. And I will pass back to Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you, everybody. That was just so interesting and engaging. So thank you so much for all taking part in this today. Thank you to all attendees for coming along as well. And um, a video and resources referred to will be distributed and the next bit of information is scheduled for March 2020 so keep an eye on that and goodbye everyone we'll see you next time. Bye.